Welcome to this C++ in Action webinar, Move Your C++ Projects to C++ Builder 10 Seattle. I'm David I, and with me is Al Manorino, and with the help of others, we're going to take you through many of the aspects that are related to how you can move your projects forward to use C++ Builder 10 Seattle. It's a short agenda, but we've got lots of content to cover. We want to get right into it. We're going to take a look at how you can migrate your projects, crossing the Unicode chasm, dealing with 32-bit and 64-bit Windows, iOS, and Android in the C++11 language, a little bit about how you can update your user interface of your projects with the Windows 10 look and feel, as well as some new VCL components that you can use on Windows 7, 8, and Windows 10. You can also think another way about how to migrate your projects by leaving your VCL and FireMonkey applications where they are and using application tethering to enhance or extend your existing projects. And then we're going to show you a little bit about parallel programming, another way to get more throughput in your user applications and have a more responsive user interface for your users. And we'll end the webinar with Q&A. The effort involved in moving your C++ Builder projects forward will depend on which version of C++ Builder you're currently using. Now, some of you may have different projects that are built and being maintained with different versions of C++ Builder. We want to help you move all of those projects forward. The effort involved depends on several different aspects of your development environment, the libraries and frameworks, and the types of projects and language features that you're using. So first, the IDE and any plugins, you'll need to make sure that you have all the right IDE options set, all the right project options set. The frameworks you use, VCL and FireMonkey, those have continued to move forward. Also, which built-in components and libraries you're using, as well as third-party and external components and libraries that you're also taking advantage of. Our technology partner directory and the Get It Package Manager may help you in some aspects of open source projects, components, libraries, commercial components, and so on. And finally, a big one, if you're using a pre-C++ Builder 2009 release, you'll have to deal with Unicode in the VCL and parts of the runtime library. We have a Unicode and Migration Center that can help you. Let's take a look at a few of the resources that are available online. The first thing is the doc wiki. So the docwiki.embarkado.com for Rad Studio 10 Seattle has information about the IDE, Windows development, multi-device development, mobile development, and so on. There's a section on migrating from previous versions. You'll see that on the screen. In particular, there are links for C++, migrating your desktop applications maybe to mobile, or moving your projects forward from 32-bit to 64-bit, moving to Unicode, uh, dealing with language features and taking advantage of new language features and support for different target platforms. We have a C++ reference homepage that'll take you through different specifics for different versions. And also, if you need to look back, you'll notice on the left-hand side, there's DocWiki systems for previous versions of C++ Builder as well. So in here, we'll find uh, links to the libraries, links to the compilers, links to a developer's guide, and so on. The developer's guide will take you through the different aspects of working with components, moving applications forward, starting new projects, migrating to different database access techniques, and so on. Now, we'll go over this in more detail, but we have the Clang Enhanced C++ compilers that give you the C++11 language for 32-bit Windows, 64-bit Windows, 32- and 64-bit iOS, and for Android. For 64-bit Windows application development, we have lots of resources to help you with the differences if you're moving from a 32-bit to a 64-bit world. We have a language compliance page that has all of the C++11 features listed on the left-hand side with links to white papers for the standard. And then there's columns for each of our compilers that support some of the different language features in the C++11 language. For the standard C++ library, we use Dinkumware, and depending on the compilers and platforms, we have different versions supported there. Same thing for the Boost libraries on 32-bit and 64-bit. Again, it depends on the base technology that we use for the compilers, either the classic C++ compiler or the Clang Enhanced C++ compiler. More about that in a moment. 
Also, if you're looking for third-party components, you can go to our technology partner directory and do a search either by company name or product name, or you can search here under C++ Builder. You can say, what are supported going back to C++ Builder 6? There are several pages about enabling C++ applications for Unicode. If you have some old projects you're trying to move forward, again, that pre-C++ Builder 2009 world. There's lots of those resources, as well as a whole migration and Unicode set of resources at our Migration and Upgrade Center. We provide Clang Enhanced Compilers for Win32, Win64, iOS, and Android in C++ Builder 10 Seattle. On the mobile side, we have support for automatic reference counting, and there's documentation for all of that. Here's the different compilers. New in 10 Seattle is the Clang Enhanced Compiler for 32-bit windows. That's based on Clang 3.3. And we're doing work to move to newer releases of Clang and LLVM. These are the compilers that are supported in 10 Seattle. We also have support for the classic C++ 0x compiler, and there's a project option for choosing for 32-bit windows between the classic compiler and the Clang Enhanced compiler. You'll see that in one of the demos. Again, for Dinkumware, uh, you've got uh, support on the Clang Enhanced compilers for version 6.5, and then for the classic compilers 5.01. For the standard library for iOS, it's included as part of the iOS SDK. For Android, it's included in the SDK NDK. And for Boost, you can get the latest Boost that we support using the Get It Package Manager. Now for choosing on Win32, new in 10 Seattle, you have this new project option to set whether you want to use the classic compiler in your C++ 32-bit Windows projects or use the new Clang Enhanced Compiler. If you set true or do the checkbox for classic compiler, then it'll use the C++0x compiler. If you want to take advantage of the C++11 language, then turn that off and do a build. For Windows 64-bit, that was introduced in C++ Builder XZ3. So if you're coming from older versions, uh, that's a, a move forward. It used a Clang Enhanced C++11 compiler that supports both VCL and FireMonkey. In version XZ6, we also provided the capability to build 64-bit Windows packages or BPL files. You can also do static linking of Windows packages, and you can consume packages as well. A few other quick notes. For Win32 and Win64, size T is the same size as a, as a pointer. For Win32, uh, int and long and pointers are 32-bit. For Win64, long, long and pointers are 64-bit while int and long stay 32-bit. That's in the standard for the language. If you're doing anything with message cracking on the Windows API, just be aware that L Resort, WParam, and LParam are 64-bits. If you're going to build and design applications in the IDE, you still need the 32-bit design time components that you use in your C++ projects. Uh, our partners and we provide those design time components because the IDE is still a 32-bit IDE. So you can drag and drop your components and lay out your forms. And then at link time, when you choose target of 64-bit windows, it'll pull in the 64-bit packages. We've got some defines for 64-bit and 32-bit development. Underbar Win32 is defined for both Win32 and Win64 targets. Underbar Win64 is only defined for 64-bit targets. Assembly language in the 64-bit and Clang Enhanced Compilers, it follows the the Clang model, the at t model, you can't mix assembly and source code. Uh, functions must be either written completely in assembly, Pascal, or C++. Uh, here's just a coverage of the built-in types. These are all in the doc wiki. So when you look at uh, sign chars and ints and so on, notice that native int will float so that it's either four bytes on 32-bit windows. Native int, for example, the tag property moves from four to eight bytes. Here's the floating point types. Again, the only special one here is the extended or long double. Uh, we use the T extended 80 rect, which is 10 bytes on Win64. For pointers, again, it's four byte pointers on 32-bit windows, eight byte pointers on 64-bit windows. And then there's some other types here, and you can take a look at those uh, in the doc wiki. Let's go in the ID and let's look at a few of the samples very quickly. So first example is just size of native int. So this one uh, just says take the size of the button tag, tag property on all the components, 
uh, is defined as native int, so it's going to float between 32-bit and 64-bit. So we're just going to set the button's text property to the size in bytes of the of the tag property. So we've got this set for 32-bit compiling. Let's run it. And here it says the size of native int is four bytes. And then we'll go and change the platform to 64-bit windows, hit run. And now size of native int is eight bytes. Here's a little memory allocation program. It's gonna try to allocate a four gigabytes of memory. So on Win32, that's not gonna be possible. So we have a try block here to catch an exception uh, when we try to allocate memory and there's none left. So it's gonna go through and it's gonna allocate a megabyte at a time to try to get up to four gigabytes. So we'll run it on Win32 and it counts up and it gets an exception when it gets just below two gigabytes. And then let's change this to 64-bit windows. And now we'll see it count up to four gigabytes of memory working just fine in our 64-bit address space. And then I wanna open up one more example, sort vector. Sort vector was added when we added 64-bit to C++ using the C++ 11 language. What it's got is two list boxes. We're going to generate some random numbers, put it in the first list box, and then sort those numbers and put them in the second list box. It's going to use the auto keyword. And then in a header file, we have a C++ Lambda that we're using to do the comparison as part of the sorting of the vector and returning uh, whether one value is less than the other value. So this example, if we run it on Win32, we say project options compiler, use classic compiler. If we turn that true and we try to compile it, it's gonna give us an error because it doesn't understand auto and it doesn't understand that lambda as well. Let's go back now and change the option to turn off using the classic compiler. Now it's gonna use the Clang enhanced C++11 compiler for Win32. So it compiles and links, we'll generate the random numbers and then use the lambda to sort those random numbers. For 64-bit, uh, we don't have that option of classic compiler, we just have the Clang Enhance compiler. So let's run this sample as well. We'll generate the random numbers and then sort them and put them in the list. In 10 Seattle, we also added some new VCL controls, the relative panel, the toggle switch, the search box, the split view, and the activity indicator. The great thing about these new controls is that they work on Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10. So if you've got projects that you want to build in 10 Seattle and target your users using different older versions instead of Windows 10, all of these controls will work for you. We also have sets of styles for Windows 10 that you can use if you want to have your applications have a Windows 10 look and feel both for VCL and FireMonkey. And we also have, for Windows 10, support for Windows 10 notifications and Windows 10 shared contracts that allow you to send data from one application to another, as well as a set of interface units for doing WinRT programming specific to Windows 10. So let's take a look at some demos from Serena DuPont and Al Manorino. In Rad Studio 10 Seattle, we added five new VCL UI controls. Those new user interface controls were specifically designed for Windows 10, but also support older versions of Windows, such as Windows 8 and Windows 7. They also have full support for custom styling. To access those five new VCL controls, you can go to the Windows 10 category in the tool palette, and there you will find T Search Box, T Toggle Switch, T Relative Panel, T Split View, and T Activity Indicator. Now, for each of those five new VCL controls, you will find Object Pascal and C++ demos in the demos folder that gets installed with your Rad Studio 10 Seattle installation. Now the relative panel is a new layout panel that provides a lot of flexibility for designing your user interfaces. It lets you position and align child objects in relation to each other or the parent panel. So for example, you can specify to have a text element always positioned to the left side of the panel and a button always below the text. 
Now, as you can see with this container control, the relative panel, we have parented a button to it, an edit to it, a shape, etc. And if I select the button, for example, here or the edit, you will see that there are properties for aligning that control with the panel. So, for example, there's a line left with panel, line right with panel, line top with panel property. And you can see in this demo here, we have set up a checkbox and we set up an on click event that allows you to programmatically align that control with the panel. And you can, of course, choose from many different uh, alignment options. So now let's have a look at uh, this demo here. And you'll see when I run this demo that I can select from multiple styles. So for example, the Windows 10 Blue style, the Windows 10 Dark style, uh, the Windows 10 style. We also support for uh, older Windows styles, custom styles, etc. And you see here I can select align left with panel, align right with panel. I can select the button and set alignments for that as well, and I could go and select the uh, shape, and I can select uh, alignments for that as well. Now the next uh, control that I'd like to have a look at here is the T-Split View control. And the T-Split View control allows you to easily show and hide application content. And it's designed to be used as a navigational menu, such as a slide and drawer. And as you can see here in this demo, and this is an example that's also included with Rad Studio 10 Seattle, we have our split view control. We have this hamburger icon here. And this is a uh, icon that's commonly referred to as the hamburger icon, the three line icon. That is a very common UI element that you might be familiar with on mobile to show and hide a slide and drawer menu. And so we have support now with the T-Split View Control to easily add a slide in drawer menu to your VCL applications. And the T-Split View Control has a multitude of different options that you can choose from for that as well. So for example, we can select a closing style, whether the uh, menu itself, the slider menu will collapse or be shown as a compact menu. If it's collapsed, this entire menu here will be will slide out of view. If it's shown as a co uh, compacted menu, then you will see the icons. Still, once the menu slides out of view, the icons will still be visible on the screen. We also have a display mode option here, of course, docked or overlaid. We have uh, the opening width that we can set how wide this particular menu panel is. Once it's shown, whether we want to use animation, etc. And so, for example, here you can see if I select the uh, uh, the split view, we can select to close it or not, depending on what option is set, of course. And then also, when it once it's closed, then we adjust the button width and the button options. And this demo is really a good example to look at to get a better understanding of what T split view is all about. If you're familiar with the FireMonkey control T MultiView, T MultiView is a similar control. Uh, T MultiView and FireMonkey was designed to be used across multiple different form factors uh, to provide a popover menu, a docked menu, a slide and drawer menu, etc., for multi device applications. And T Split View is quite similar to that for VCL Windows applications. So now let's run this application here on our Windows machine. You can see here I'm running this on Windows 10. I can show and hide my uh, slide and drawer here, my split view. I can select the overlay display mode, and you can see this will slide over the UI controls on the form. I can also select a compact closing style. So as I'm closing the actual split view, if I select a closing style of compact, you'll still see the icons here. Uh, if I select collapse, then the entire menu will be collapsed. You can also set the animation delay so you can set the speed at which the uh, drawer slides in or out, uh, animation step. And you can also adjust the placement of the split view control. And of course, you can also style this control. So here we have, for example, a, cu a custom style, Iceberg Classical. You can see we can create our own, uh, we can uh, create our own custom styles and also use the split view control with the custom style as well. And then of course, adjust the UI elements accordingly. So that if you're using custom icons, the color scheme, etc., works well with that particular style. And you can see here we have um, the dark style. We also have support, of course, for the Windows 10 blue style. And then we also have support for the Windows 10 light style. Now, in this release, we also added a T-toggle switch control for VCL applications. And this control makes it really easy to add a switch to your VCL Windows applications. 
It can be fully styled using the new Windows 10 styles and also has support for custom styling through the premium styles, for example, that are part of the bonus pack. You can easily switch between two states on and off. You can set to show or hide the captions, and you can also provide your own custom captions as well. So you can see here there's a show state option. It allows you to show and hide the state. You can set state captions. And of course, you could also set all those values programmatically. And this demo is an example that is included uh, with RAD Studio 10 Seattle. So I'm going to deploy this application. And here you see an example of the uh, switch. And again, it has support for different types of styles. So for example, I selected to Iceberg Classical here. Or I can switch to our Windows 10 Blue style. And it has the traditional Windows 10 styling. You can show or hide the captions, the on-off captions. You could also select your own. So for example, you could set this to manual or auto. So you could customize the text that is shown next to your uh, switch control. You can select it to be left justified or right justified. If I select the window style here, I can also switch between some of the uh, color schemes. For example, I can change easily change and adjust the fill. And of course, like I mentioned before, this has support for the Windows 10 styles as well as uh, other default styles that are included with uh, VCL applications that you can set via project options or premium styles. So for example, if you go to project options here and you go to application appearance, you can select some of the premium styles, for example, copper, which is a new style that's part of the premium style pack that is available with Rad Studio 10 Seattle. I can select some of the other styles as well. And then when I run and deploy this application, you'll see that my VCL style dropdown has been updated and you see a custom style now that I can choose from. For example, for the copper style, I can select the green emerald style, etc. So this just shows you that the toggle switch fully supports both Windows 10 styling as well as custom styling. You can resize the control, etc. Now the search box control is an edit control that has multiple customizable properties. So for example, you can set a search indicator of a text icon or an audio icon. You can show an hint, a hint. You can uh, uh, set a variety of additional properties and it is fully stylable as well. So I'm going to run this application here to show you what the search box control looks like. So for example, I can type hello and then I can hit search and it will be shown here in my log and I could also select SBI audio and you would see the audio icon and I can hit search and of course this control is also fully stylable as you can see here as well. Now the last control I want to show you is the T activity indicator control and this is an indeterminate progress ring indicator and it lets you choose between many different properties it's fully stylable etc so you can drop the T activity indicator control onto your form you can select to animate this control, you can adjust the indicator color, you can select the indicator size, you can select the indicator type, etc. So now let's have a look at what uh, the indicator looks like at runtime. So first we're going to check off to animate this control. We have a rotating sector, we have a rotating ring, and we have the momentum dots. And these momentum dots are the indeterminate ring uh, indicator style dots that you are probably familiar with and have seen on Windows 8 and Windows 10. And then we can adjust the indicator size as well. We can select white or black uh, and it's fully supported with both default styles and also custom styles. Now in RAD Studio 10 Seattle we added a new option to enable high DPI awareness in your VCL applications and you can set that via project options you can toggle this enable high DPI setting and what that means is when you're moving a form from one monitor to another monitor that has a different DPI the VCL application and the controls on your form will automatically be rescaled according to the new DPI and there's no specific coding or any changes that you need to make programmatically to support that in your application. So that's another great feature that was added in RAD Studio 10 Seattle. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to our blog 
on community.embarcadere.com and you can have a look at Luis Navarro's blog that talks about new per DPI awareness and VCL applications. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Windows 10 VCL UI controls that I showed you today, you can also go to blogs, select Serena DuPont, and you can browse to my getting started with the new Windows 10 VCL UI controls in Red Studio 10 Seattle blog post, where I highlight the controls that I showed you today. I also list where you can access the demos, etc. Our doc wiki also has a lot of great information about the new Windows 10 controls. So for example, there's a tutorial that talks about how to use the relative panel tips and tricks, etc. And uh, a lot of API documentation as well on the new VCL Windows 10 controls. Now next, I'm going to show you the FireMonkey T MultiView control and how to use the new navigation pane mode in your FireMonkey Windows 10 applications combined with the new FireMonkey Windows 10 styles. Now here you can see an example of the T MultiView control and we have many different uh, style elements to choose from and if I go down here to my style lookup you'll see the different multi-view labeled style elements that I can choose from. And these are designed to be smaller and have room for text next to them so that when you expand this menu, you're able to see the text descriptor right next to the icon. I'm also using a custom icon in this example. So I have an imageless control here on my form and I've added a custom image to it. This is just a PNG that I had on my hard drive. And this is item zero. And then the only thing you have to do to be able to select that image is select your controls. So in this case, it's speed button four. And then we browse down here to our images property and select image list one and then image index zero because our custom icon is item zero. That's the first item in the list here. And this way we're able to use our custom icon. Let's deploy this application here. And you can see that in the sample, I have uh, all my custom icons that are applied through the style itself and then I also have the um, custom image that I've set. And then also I've set up on click events here to um, automatically close the menu on click and you can see that there's just an e a simple event that you can use to uh, hide the multi view and then it will collapse down to the size that you've set. So if we go here to the multi view we have a new mode for Windows 10 specifically that we created. It's called the navigation pane mode that you can select. And then we have a navigation uh, pane options menu and we can select the collapsed width. And that's the width that you see here, 51 pixels. That's the collapsed width that will be shown when this menu is collapsed. Now I also wanted to show you this recipe manager example. This of course also uses the uh, multi-view control here as you can see. We have our master button set up. So the multi-view has a property called master button that you can utilize. In this case, I selected the master button uh, drawer and drawer is just the name of the button here. You can see it's just a speed button control. Uh, this master button allows us to show and hide the slide and drawer. Of course, this is using the Windows 10 light style. I'm able to easily customize the look of that control as well using the style lookup options that are shown for the light style here. And now let's run this application. And then here you can see the slide and menu again. And this is just another example of the Windows 10 drawer style slide and menu. And this is something you'll see with many different um, applications that are installed by default with Windows 10 today that, had, that use that same UI paradigm. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Al Manorino. Windows 10 notifications is supported on both a VCL and FireMonkey in both Object Pascal and C++. So here's the C++ FireMonkey version. Uh, it's coded uh, exactly the same way as the Object Pascal version. Let me run the C++ FireMonkey version and we'll see what it does. This time I'm going to open up the Windows 10 Action Center notifications panel. So when we click on Show Notification 1, it shows up in our Action Center. If I click on Show Notification number 2, we also see the notification in our Action Center. If I say Cancel Notification 1, it goes away. Cancel Notification 2, it goes away. If I show them again, and I say Cancel All, they all go away. Uh, click Show Notification number 2, uh, select it, 
it shows up in our notification received inside of the notifications log. So that also all works great. I mentioned in the beginning that Delphi 10 Seattle includes the WinRT support. Uh, but for C++ Builder 10 Seattle, you need to go to Tools, Get It Package Manager, and from here is where you can uh, install the C++ interfaces for Windows 10 WinRT access. So that's how you do it. For this example, I'm going to use the Sharing Contract Framework version of the application, which uses the RTL framework instead of using the uh, Sharing Contract component. So the first thing we do on our form create, here we are going to uh, initialize to create the wrapper using the F share wrapper. And then just like we did with the uh, sharing contract component app, uh, when we click on our share button, we are going to set the shared properties. So here we get to fill in all the information that we want to share, like application name and description, and all the other values are just to assign properties to the framework or the component. So that's all we really need to do. And lastly, we call uh, init sharing from the from the wrapper, and that's going to launch the sharing process, and it's going to show and list the applications that can receive our shared information. So let's run this C++ version of this sharing contract framework app just to see if we get the same results. But before I do, I want to change its VCL style. So under Project Options, uh, Appearance, I'm going to pick a different uh, new Windows 10 style. So if in this case, I'm going to use the new Windows 10 dark style, set it as my default. And now I'm going to run the app. And now we see the app comes up with our nice new Windows 10 dark style. So that's really cool. Clicking on the share button opens up the share panel that lists the applications that can receive our shared data that we are sharing from the app. Uh, I'm going to select the mail app and I'm going to pick my Hotmail account. This time we're using the framework and we see it creates the instance of the mail app and we see our date title shows up as the subject of the mail. We get our images of the penguins as the attachments that we are sharing from the app. And we also get our web address link data that we're using uh, in the body of the mail message. So all of that works great, either using the share contract component or using it through the uh, RTL framework. And now Al Manorino is going to take you through an extensive review and demo of using Unicode in your C++ project. Over to you, Al. For the agenda, we'll look at working with Unicode in C++ Builder. So as you know, for string data type, a C++ Builder offers several choices. So your code can use C style characters and strings, or C++ string objects, or VCL string objects. And each of these has its own set of Unicode variations. Also, the Windows API provides both ANSI and Unicode variants. We'll look at the new C and C++ data types for C style strings, such as WCHAR underscore T and CHAR16 underscore T and CHAR32 underscore T. We'll look at the new Unicode VCL string classes so starting with Rad Studio 2009, the VCL offers several string classes which support ANSI, UTF-8, and UTF-16 encodings. We'll see that most member functions of these new VCL string classes operate just as they did before a Unicode string class. We'll also look at the underscore tchar maps to option which determines whether or not the Unicode preprocessor macro is defined. And that determines whether you get the ANSI variant or the wide string UTF-16 variant. We'll also look at the standard Windows header, the tchar header file, that includes macros designed to let you write code that compiles as either ANSI or Unicode. And we'll see 
how this can help when converting code one portion at a time. So we'll see how this header is valuable to write character-wide agnostic code that, the comp that can compile as either ANSI or Unicode, and that lets you prepare for the migration in your previous versions of C++ Builder without breaking compilation. We'll look at converting text to and from Unicode because we need to know how to convert between the various Unicode encodings and the various ANSI encodings. And we'll see that the two easiest ways for doing this are using the Windows API and using the VCL. And lastly, we'll also look at how to load and save Unicode characters to files because you can use Unicode characters with VCL comp components like the T-Memo, the T-List box, the T-Combo box, the T-Edit box, etc. So we need to know if any modifications are needed to our C++ Builder programs to handle Unicode characters for these components. For an introduction to Unicode in C++ Builder, since C++ Builder 2009, we now have full Unicode support throughout both the VCL and the runtime library and Unicode is critical for internationalization. Now migrating to Unicode will be easier than you think. And a first thought to consider is that you may not have to migrate to Unicode to use C++ Builder. So why is this, you might be asking? Well, C++ is a diverse language permitting the use of many libraries and several programming paradigms. And while your code that uses the VCL does need to be Unicode aware, your code that uses the C runtime library, the software template library, or the Windows API, for example, can continue to use ANSI and only convert to Unicode when passing data to or from the VCL. Now, a complete migration to Unicode is necessary to gain the full benefits of internationalization, but migrating only the VCL portion of your code can simplify the task of upgrading to 10 Seattle while letting you gain the significant benefits offered in the current 10 Seattle release. So whether you decide to make your entire application Unicode aware or to upgrade only the portions that interact with the VCL, we're going to discuss several C and C++ development techniques that can make the task much easier. For a C++ builder, Unicode migration resource to start with, if you have not read it already, take a look at this Migrating Legacy C++ Builder Apps to C++ Builder 10 Seattle blog post on our Embarcadero community website. It provides tips and techniques to help you with your C++ Builder migration working with Unicode. And once you get a handle on these tips and techniques, our C++ Builder customers have reported it didn't take long to migrate their applications. To move your legacy C++ Builder projects to 10 Seattle, you have a few options. So option one is to just open your old project files and or project groups in C++ Builder and the IDE will update the project file, rebuild the project, look at any compile and or link errors or warnings and, and fix them as needed. Or you have option number two, which is what I recommend, don't let C++ Builder convert your old projects. Instead, copy your source files into a new folder and then in C++ Builder 10 Seattle, create a new project of the same project type and then start adding your source files to the new project. So it is a little more effort at first doing it this way, but it's going to save you a lot of time later on. Let's go into C++ Builder 10 Seattle and take a quick look at a typical Unicode migration item. So here I'm using uh, C++ Builder 10 Seattle subscription update one. So I created a new uh, VCL forms application and I copied in its source code. When I go to build the application, I get some errors. Looking at the errors, it tells me that I cannot convert char const to const a y char underscore t. So this tells me uh, Unicode conversions may be needed, like ANSI characters need to be converted to Unicode. So all VCL functions that used to accept arguments of type char asterisk, for example, you know, application message box, now require a y char underscore t asterisk. 
of VCL object properties that return ANSI string now return Unicode string. So for example, the caption property of a T label. So here's an example where you cannot blind cast. So a char asterisk star is not a Y char underscore T asterisk. So to resolve this Unicode conversion error, we can use a Unicode string with a C underscore string function. And that will return for us a Y char underscore T. And the C underscore string function gives us the current value of the string object. And Unicode string is a new class containing 16-bit and a Y char underscore T data in the UTF-16 encoding. So to resolve this error, for both the open string and the URL string, I'm going to use the Unicode string with the C underscore string function, and that's going to return for me a a y char underscore t. So now if I build and run this application it should work fine. And if I click on the label that's our URL string it should open up our web browser and go to Embarcadero.com. So all of that works great. Let's take a step back and look at Unicode in C. So here is sample C code with examples of Unicode literals, escape codes, and preprocessor macros. So C developers are used to using string header functions such as stir length and stir copy and, and stir cat to manipulate you know, C style strings. In Unicode, there are corresponding functions for manipulating C style wide char underscore T strings. So most wide char underscore T functions are defined in both the wide char header file and in the traditional header file, you know, string header for plain string manipulation and standard I.O. header file for I.O. etc. Let me take this code and drop it into 10 Seattle and we'll see that it builds just fine. Let me open up this project in 10 Seattle. I have it in my C++ Unicode in C project. Uh, it's a console app. So here's the code and if I go and build this it should build just fine. So it builds fine, no errors, so that's fine. All right, next, let's take a quick look at Unicode in C++. And to show you this, uh, let me do it inside of the C++ Builder 10 Seattle uh, IDE. So here's Unicode in C++. Now, string manipulation in C++ usually involves the use of the standard string class, as well as various I.O. stream classes for input, output, and string buffering. Now developers also familiar with Boost may also use classes like Boost Regex or Boost Format to help with string manipulation. But as it turns out, like we see here in this code, switching to the wide char underscore T version of these classes is quite easy. All you need to do is prefix a W to each of the class names. So this code shows sample char string code in C++ and its corresponding wide char underscore uh, T code. So we see that a string becomes a wide string and a string stream uh, becomes a wide string stream. And if we build and run this app it should just build and run just fine. So there it is. So that all works great also. Looking at Unicode in VCL, we see that the VCL offers these six string classes which support ANSI, UTF-8, and UTF-16 encodings. So we have ANSI string, which corresponds to the old string class. It contains 8-bit char data in the system default code page. We have the new Unicode string, and that's a new class containing 16-bit wide char underscore T data in the UTF-16 encoding. Wide string still exists from previous versions of Rad Studio, and it corresponds to COMS BSTR data type. So that's the basic string or the binary string data type. And it contains a 16-bit wide char underscore T data, just like the Unicode string. Now, because Unicode string uses C++ Builder's own memory management, and reference counting, it's often faster than wide string. 
So unless you need easy interoperability with COM, then you should use the new Unicode string class instead of the wide string. ANSI string T is a class template that contains 8-bit char data encoded in any code page. And the code page is given as the template parameter. So ANSI string is actually a type def for ANSI string uh, T. Now this requirement that the code page be given as a template parameter prevents you from using ANSI string T with arbitrary code pages at runtime. So if you need that capability, you may need to instead use the raw byte string or use one of the C or C++ string manipulation methods instead of using the VCL. UTF-8 string is an ANSI string T instantiation using the UTF-8 encoding. And lastly, raw byte string contains 8-bit char data in an unspecified code page. So the VCL will avoid applying any code page conversions to raw byte strings. It becomes the calling code's responsibility to correctly handle code pages issues. Using raw byte string can have several advantages. Since each code page is otherwise a separate compile time type, raw byte string lets you write a single routine that can handle any code page. It removes any VCL overhead of doing code page conversions itself, and it prevents possible loss of data from automatically converting text data into encodings that can't represent some characters. The good news with all of this is that most member functions of these new string classes operate just the same as they did for the old non-unicode string classes before C++ Builder 2009. Here's a quick example on using the ANSI string T code page template to pass Unicode Cyrillic data from code page 1251 to 65001 and back to Unicode without any data loss. So that's very cool. Windows 1251 is a popular 8-bit character encoding designed to cover languages that use the Cyrillic script, such as Russian, Bulgarian, Serbian Cyrillic, and other languages and it is most widely used for encoding the Bulgarian, Serbian, and Macedonian languages. Code page 65001 is UTF-8. Here are some useful string handling and Unicode with C++. So first a short string occupies as many bytes as its maximum length plus one and the first byte contains the current dynamic length of the string and the following bytes contain the characters of the string. And the length byte and the characters are considered unsigned values. So the maximum string, string length is 255 characters plus a length byte, and that gets us our string uh, 255. For string literal prefixes, here's examples on how to use capital L, lowercase u, and uppercase u for Unicode, UTF-16 and UTF-32 string literals. Now length is a member of Unicode string, ANSI string, and wide string in C++. And you can use string.length for the length of the string. For checking for Unicode strings, you can use system Unicode string is lead surrogate. And that returns true if the indexed element is a lead surrogate and false otherwise or you can use Unicode string is trail surrogate and that returns true if the index element is a trail surrogate and false otherwise. With both methods, the index is an element index into the string, not a character or byte index. Looking at Unicode and Windows API, we see that the Windows API includes both Unicode and ANSI variants. So for example, if we look at the message box function, it's actually two different functions, right? Message box A, which takes ANSI strings, and message box W, which takes wide UTF-16 strings. So message box itself is a macro that resolves to message box A or message box W, depending on your preprocessor macros and project options. Now you're also free to explicitly call one API variant or the other, regardless of your project options, simply by calling message box A or message box W directly. 
and other Windows API functions dealing with text or string data have similar variants. Now which variant you get is determined by whether or not the Unicode preprocessor macro is defined. In C++ Builder, this macro is automatically defined depending on your project's options. In upcoming slides and demonstrations, we'll see how you can change the Unicode preprocessor macro using the underscore tchar maps to option. And we'll also see in a moment how the Unicode macro also affects the use of standard Windows tchar header file in writing code that can compile as ANSI or Unicode. And lastly on this slide, the Windows API also includes functions such as char next and char previous and compare string that are capable of dealing with complexities such as composite characters and surrogate pairs. So all of this is great. Next let's look at the C++ data types for C style string. So working with Unicode introduces several more C and C++ data types for C style strings. So I mentioned these previously under Unicode in C and Unicode in VCL, but they also apply to C++. So just to be complete, here they are again. The uh, char 16 underscore T and the char 32 underscore T specifies the two new character types for holding UTF-16 and UTF-32 data respectively. The char 16 underscore t values, they're written using the string literal prefix lowercase u, and the char 32 underscore t, those values are written using the string literal prefix uppercase u. And lastly, uh, C++ also has the ANSI string t code page template that contains 8-bit char data encoded in any code page and the code page is given as the template parameter and if needed you can create your own ANSI string types. Let's spend some time on this underscore tchar maps to option in C++ Builder. In the C++ Builder IDE this underscore tchar maps to option controls the floating definition of underscore tchar. So you have two choices. So if underscore t char maps to y char underscore t, this is the typical default for C++ applications that use the VCL or FireMonkey. The other option would be underscore t char maps to char. And if it's set to char, this is the default for C++ applications that do not use the VCL or FireMonkey such as C++ console applications. Before you can set this option to y char underscore t, your project must have an entry point called underscore t main or underscore t win main. Now new projects created with Rad Studio have these entry points by default, but imported projects might need to have these entry points added by hand. And that's another reason when you are migrating your legacy projects to the newer 10 Seattle to first create a new project either VCL or FireMonkey and then copy your source code into the new project. As we see here on this slide to change this option from the IDE it's under the project options C++ shared options the underscore teacher maps to option. So if this underscore teacher maps to is set to char then the Unicode preprocessor macro is left undefined and the ANSI variant is used. If it's set to y char underscore t then the Unicode macro is defined and the wide string UTF-16 variant is used. Also when set to wide char underscore t the core header file a t char defines the macros for Unicode builds and in writing code that can compile as ANSI or Unicode. Now we're going to take a look at the tchar header file in the next slide. So for C++ code that interacts with the Windows API and VCL, it's better off having underscore tchar set to wide char underscore t 
like we see here on this slide. Let's now talk about how do you use the Windows teacher header file with Unicode. So it can be valuable to write character width agnostic code that can compile as ANSI or Unicode. So if you're planning on a complete Unicode migration as part of an upgrade to C++ Builder 10 Seattle, character width agnostic code lets you prepare for the migration in your previous version of C++ Builder without breaking compilation. And Windows provides us with this tchar header file to help with this. Depending on whether the underscore Unicode preprocessor macro is defined, as we just discussed in the last slide by setting C++ Builders uh, underscore tchar maps to option, this tchar header defines the following macros for Unicode builds. So tchar, which is defined as char for non-Unicode builds, or it's defined as ychar underscore t for Unicode builds. Underscore t, which is removed by the preprocessor for non-Unicode builds, and is defined as uppercase L for Unicode builds. So this means that you can write underscore T, hello world, and the preprocessor converts it to a char literal, hello world. Or, or Y char underscore T literal, and that gives us the uppercase L, hello world, as appropriate. And here are the other macros you get for Unicode builds from the tchar header file. So for example, we have the wide string cat to append one string to another. We have the wide string uh, print f to write formatted output to standard out. Uh, we have the wide string get c to get the next character from a stream. And we have the wide toi to convert a string to an integer. And macros are also provided for file and directory manipulation functions so that you can manipulate ANSI or Unicode file names as appropriate. So you can look at the source code for this include tchar header file for a complete list of available macros and using these macros is very simple. Let's now take a look at an application to show us how to work with the underscore tchar maps to option and use the tchar header macros. Here's a C++ Builder 10 Seattle VCL Forms application. It has two buttons and a T-Edit box. Now in the edit box, I have Unicode characters. So the C++ Builder IDE is fully Unicode aware, meaning you can enter Unicode characters in the VCL controls, like the T-Edit or a T-List box. And you can enter Unicode characters directly for the properties of the controls like for the text property of the t-edit or the name of the control. So if I want to change the name of my edit one to these Unicode characters I can do that. So I can copy these characters and let me search for the name and instead of calling it edit one I can replace it with those Unicode characters and the IDE will know what to do with it. So that's pretty cool. But let me put its name back to edit1 because it's a lot easier for me to work with it as edit1 rather than those Unicode characters. And if I needed or wanted, I could enter Unicode characters directly into the code without resorting to any escape characters. With the message box button, I'm calling the Windows API message box and I'm putting out a string, hello C++ Builder 10 Seattle. You see here I'm using the tchar header macro underscore t, but I could have also used the underscore text macro. Now to be able to use this underscore t macro, I needed to include the tchar header file. The underscore t is a macro that converts 8-bit strings into wide character format. Also using the underscore t macro, I'm outputting the caption for the message box to say message box dash literal string and an OK for the message box OK button. After that, if I have Unicode defined, meaning that I have underscore t char map to y char underscore t, 
Then I'm going to output the text from my edit box. So if I have Unicode defined, then the text could be either ANSI or Unicode, and it should output and display correctly. Uh, but if I don't have Unicode defined, meaning underscore tchar maps to char, then I'm going to use ANSI string and do this cast using the C underscore string function and take the string text from the edit box. So this way this application will work whether the code or the application I'm building is on a Unicode enabled system or a non Unicode enabled system. Looking at my project options uh, C++ shared options, we see that our underscore tchar maps to y char underscore t. So this sets the Unicode defines and the wide string UTF-16 variant is used. So now let's run this app and see what it does. Run the app. So when I click on the message box button, we display the string Hello, C++ Builder 10 Seattle, using the underscore T macro, and we display the message box caption, message box literal string, that's also using the underscore T macro. Now, when I click the OK button, now, since Unicode is defined, we output the Unicode text characters from the edit box. So, since Unicode is defined, the text could be either ANSI or Unicode, and it outputs correctly like we see here. And the message box caption, message box text from my edit one text dot C underscore string also displays correctly using the underscore T macro. So that works great. Now if I go into my project options and I change the underscore teacher maps to to char and if I rerun the application let's see what happens now run the app so now this app is running with the underscore tchar maps to char so when it's set to char the Unicode preprocessor macro is left undefined and the ANSI variant is used so we have an ANSI string based application here so now when I click on the Windows API message box button with underscore tchar map to char, we see that the literal strings, the non-Unicode, uh, display OK. So now since Unicode is not defined, the app will execute the else code and the message box will try to display an ANSI string of the Unicode characters in the edit box. So when I click the OK button, because now it's an ANSI string application, uh, the Unicode text in the, edit, in the edit box displays as question marks, but otherwise the, the app still works okay. So what we see here, if we try and type Unicode text into an ANSI string based application, then we're going to get question marks for the output, but otherwise the, uh, the app works. Let me go back into project options and let me set the underscore uh, tchar maps to back to y char underscore t and then we'll rebuild and run the app and we'll see what the application uh, message box does. Looking at the event for the application message box here we are using the application class which is in the VCL and I'm going to call its version of message box. In this case since it's the VCL it's expecting the Unicode string so I'm using the underscore D macro. The underscore uppercase D macro makes a constant string wide whenever string maps to Unicode. So by using this underscore uppercase D macro, we'll assure that our string, you know, hello C++ Builder 10 Seattle string is a Unicode string. And in this second application message box call, uh, we'll output the content of the edit box. So we could take this code and we can compile it on older versions of C++ Builder and it should all just work fine with the exception of trying to display Unicode characters 
in an ANSI string based application. We saw in that case you're going to get uh, question marks for the output. But otherwise this app will work fine. Let's run the app again and this time we'll look at how the application message box behaves. So uh, in this case we're still running with underscore tchar maps to ychar underscore t. So when I click on application message box we see that the app works fine and outputs uh, Unicode characters fine. So that behaves as expected so that all works great. So the last thing I want to do with this app is once again change the project options of underscore tchar maps to and let me put this back to char and then we'll rerun the app so now let me rerun the app seeing what this does to the application message box so now with underscore tchar maps to char if I call the application class message box uh, we see that the literal strings uh, still display fine and we also see that the Unicode characters also display fine so even with underscore tchar maps to char using the application class which is in the VCL the Unicode text from the ed edit box still displays okay so that's great Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned a blog post on migrating legacy C++ Builder apps to C++ Builder 10 Seattle. So here's one of the tips that talks about should you just go ahead and replace all occurrences of string with ANSI string? We believe it's better to not just replace all occurrences of string with ANSI string, but instead define these two functions and then use them whenever one type is returned and the other type is required and vice versa. And with these two functions, we're using these two Windows API functions. One's called the wide char to multi byte, which converts from UTF 16 to the encoding of your choice, such as UTF 8 or any of the various ANSI encodings. And the other one is multi byte to wide char, which converts from the encoding of your choice to UTF 16. And you can look at the Microsoft documentation on these functions. Let's next look at how do I deal with loading and saving of Unicode items. So how do I work with the encoding and the decoding? So for example, if you have a list box, you know, how do you save and load the items from a file? Well, the, the load from file and the save to file methods, you now have a second parameter, which is the T encoding class. The T encoding class has a static property where you can specify the encoding, either ASCII or UTF-8 or Unicode or Unicode Big Indian. And if you look at the T encoding class, you'll see it has different field types like default, UTF-8, UTF-16 with Big and Little Indian and, and Byte Order Mark support. So let's run an app and see how we can use T encoding to save the file and load from file. Here's a vCell app with an edit box and a list box. So let me run this app. So with this app, I can add and delete strings from the list box. I can save the items in the list box to a file and I can load items from a file into the list box. So I have an external text file with Unicode characters that I could load into the list box. So if I click my button load from file, it loads some sample Unicode character strings into my list box. And if I select one of these strings from the list box, we see it nicely gets displayed on the caption property of a T label. So why can it do that? Because the VCL is fully Unicode enabled. That's why. So that's cool. So how do we do the load from file and save to file? Well, if we look at load from file, we look at its method, we will see that this method comes from the classes unit and in this unit there are declarations for load from file and save to file methods for components that contain T strings. Looking at the methods load from file and save to file we see that it now has a second parameter which is the T encoding class and the T encoding class has a static property where you can specify the encoding either ASCII or UTF-8 
or Unicode or Unicode Big Indian or Unicode uh, Little Indian. And if we look inside of this class, we see that it comes with all these different types of, of encodings that we can use. And this class also has a bunch of functions that are used inside of the encoding as well. So this app, we're using UTF-8 encoding. Now, I'll mention, if you don't supply the second T encoding parameter, then it's a null pointer. And in the runtime, if it sees a null pointer, it will use default encoding. And default encoding will be whatever the desktop you are running on, such as a Japanese desktop, or a Chinese desktop, or a USA desktop, or whatever you set the code page for your application, then it will use that encoding. But if you want to control it, and you know you are going to put Unicode characters, let's say, into a list box, or a memo, or a database memo, or you're dealing with Unicode characters in a database, in a text, or a blob field, then you want to take control of the encoding. For additional tips and techniques on migrating your legacy C++ builder code to 10 Seattle, start with the blog post I mentioned a few times called Migrating Legacy C++ Builder Apps to 10 Seattle on the community.embarcadero.com blogs website. So it offers tips and techniques like we see on this slide, plus many more. This ends what we had time to cover for this session on C++ Builder Unicode Migration. Hopefully it gave you an overview of Unicode in C, C++, uh, the VCL, and the Windows API. And hopefully it gave you an overview on how to migrate a C++ Builder application to Unicode and, and provided some useful tips and techniques for doing the migration. So for an overview approach for migrating your apps to C++ Builder 10 Seattle, here's what you can do for a minimal migration or a complete migration. And remember, Embarcadero is here to help. So let us know any Unicode migration issues you are having, and we should be able to help. For additional resources for migrating legacy C++ Builder, please visit the blog post, Migrating Legacy C++ Builder Apps to C++ Builder 10 Seattle on the community.embarcadero.com blogs website and you'll see all these additional resources to help with your migration. So hope this helps in your migrations. So once again, please let us know what specific C++ Builder Unicode issues you are having. Embarcadero is here to help. Thanks, Al. That was a great deep dive into Unicode for C++. Just want to spend a few more minutes showing you a little bit about how to use app tethering to enhance your existing applications. You could isolate the use of latest features, for example, in C++ Builder and C++11 by putting functionality into an app tethering application and drag the app tethering components into your existing applications and recompiling them in 10 Seattle. App tethering allows you to run actions remotely, to pass data back and forth between your applications, both for VCL and FireMonkey application targets. Let's take a look at a quick demo of app tethering in action. Let's look at this C++ Builder 10 Seattle database shopping list app. So we have a VCL Windows desktop database application. And we created this FireMonkey multi-device client application that's going to receive a shopping list each time a product stock is under the minimal stock value. And then these client apps can place orders to buy product to increase the stock. Let me first run these apps, and then we'll look into the code to see how we added app tethering. So first for the Windows VCL app, before I run it, I'm going to change it to VCL style. So to do that, it's project, options, uh, application appearance. And for this app, I'm going to select the new modern Windows 10 blue style and say OK. And now run the app. So now it should show up with this nice modern Windows 10 blue style like we see here. So that's great. And to our FireMonkey client application, I added this nice FireMonkey premium style called Emerald Crystal. And we did that by dropping a style book component onto the form, double clicking it, and, and selecting from the FireMonkey premium style pack, 
uh, this style called Emerald Crystal. Say open, apply, and close. So now let me run the FireMonkey client app as a Windows 32 bit app. So run. And it comes up. Great. These are the apps running. So we have our BCL Windows desktop application. And I started up two of our client applications. So this could be me here in New York. And this could be uh, David I in California. On the Windows desktop app, each time a product stock is under the minimal stock value, a shopping list gets generated and it's going to get sent to all of the connected app dethered clients. So me here in New York, let me click on the connect button to app dether connect to the Windows desktop app and you see I get the shopping list. And then we can have David I in California also click on connect to app dether to connect also to the Windows desktop app and he also gets the same shopping list that I see. The shopping list shows each of the products and how many more of the items are needed and we could buy 100 more of the units of the item by pressing the button. So for example we see that this item needs 900 more so if I click the buy button the buy command gets sent to the database app and the change gets reflected both on the VCL database app and also on our FireMonkey connected apps. So David I also can see that a product also needs an additional 200 units. So he'll go ahead and click the buy 100 button here. So we see the change gets reflected on the VCL database app and on all the connected client apps. So that really works great. So let's now go into C++ Builder 10 Seattle and look into the code and see how we added app dethering to these applications. This is the app dethering database shopping list app in C++ Builder 10 Seattle that we just saw running. So this is the VCL desktop database app and this is the uh, FireMonkey companion app. For both the VCL Windows desktop app and the FireMonkey client companion app, we added the two app dethering components. We added our dethering manager and our dethering app profile component. So now a manager needs to register a profile to start. So that's why you need to drop both a dethering manager component and a dethering app profile component onto the form. And then you link both components, filling in the manager property in the profile component to be your dethering manager component. Dethering manager component, we see we have a property called allowed adapters. And this allows me to switch from either using network Wi-Fi to Bluetooth to connect. Uh, for this application, we're going to connect using network Wi-Fi. Now for the client to connect to find other dether applications in the network, the client needs to execute either the auto connect or discover managers. So when I click on my connect button, we see in this case, we are using auto connect. So I call the dethering managers auto connect method that allows me to connect or find other dethered managers. Now when this timeout finishes from our dethering manager, an event called on end auto connect fires. And from here is where we're going to receive a list of discovered remote managers. And from this list of remote managers, uh, you can choose the ones you want to pair with. Now for our dethering manager, we added a password. So when you want to make a manager private, you have to fill in a password because if another manager wants to pair with you, it needs to know this password to be able to pair. So if the manager is protected by a password, as it is in this application, then you receive this event uh, on request manager password with the remote manager identifier and a password variable to fill. So you need to provide this password to be able to pair. Now if the password is wrong, then you get this on auth error from remote event. But if the pairing is okay, then you would receive this on paired to remote event along with the on and auto connect event with all of the profiles found in that manager. 
So now that we have our tethering manager connected to our tethering app profile, we can now share data or streams or remote actions with other profiles. We use the tethering app profile to be able to add either shared actions and or shared resources. So for this example, we're using shared resources. So the tethering app profile component, it has a property called resources. And here is where we can add our resources. The resource type could either be data, and that's what we're, what we're using in this application, or it can be a stream. And it also has a public name that is used in order to be referenced outside. In this case, our name is resource shopping list. Next, let's look at the VCL database app. Uh, it's tethering app profile component. It has an event called on resource received. And this, get, this event gets fired when we receive the data. And this is the code we're going to use to add 100 more uh, of the stock item. There are two more items I want to show you on this app. The first one, if we look at our companion app, uh, it's using a list view and on its on button click event for the list view and here's where we send the string by item to the connected tethered app and then the connected database tethered app performs the on resource received event and adds 100 to the product stock value for the item and on the VCL uh, database form on its on create here's where we call the uh, client data set products load from file to get our products database and on its on close event here is we do client data set products uh, save to file and lastly uh, create shopping list this is what we use to create the shopping list and um, and create shopping list also checks to see if the uh, product minimum stock value is greater than the product stock value, stock value. and if it is uh, we add that product to our shopping list. So these apps showed how you could use app tethering to send data to connected apps using the tethering profiles send string method. Another area to consider in migrating your projects to 10 Seattle is to take advantage of the Parallel Programming Library. The Parallel Programming Library will allow you to create more responsive applications by pushing off into separate threads some of the functionality, database queries, calculations, and other things. There are three areas of the PPL. There's the T-Task class which allows you to create one or more parallel tasks and has methods wait for all and wait for any to complete. There's a parallel for loop as well as a t-task future, which allows you to wait under the covers for a future value to be set. Let's take a look at a few demos of parallel programming using C++ Builder 10 Seattle. We've shipped for some time uh, the threading unit or the t-thread class. It's in the systems class systems classes area and that's sort of the underpinnings of of uh, of what's going on and then there's the system threading class uh, a unit that we have as well we'll get to that in a moment i just wanted to bring up one of our old sample applications that uh, that we've shipped in the past uh, threading this was the famous threaded sorting demo it uses paint boxes here uh, on windows the vcl application to show the progress of a bubble sort a selection sort and a quick sort but under the covers it's just starting up these different sorts so here's my start on the start button click i just say okay let's create a bubble sort a t bubble sort and uh, and it has an array and then we'll start the selection sort and we'll start the quick sort and then we want to set the on terminate for each of those to be thread done and then the the button gets enabled and then under the covers there is a code that actually executes the sorts uh, one of these allows you to set the name of the thread for debugging using the old ANSI string class and getting the class name so whether it's the bubble sort class or the or the quicksort class or the uh, 
or the selection sort class. And I, I commented out this one, this T-thread, because what I wanted to do was, was take a look for a moment at the T-thread class and see some of its options. And of course, one of those is to call execute, uh, to yield, um, to sleep, and so on. And this is the older T-thread class that we've had for a long time, uh, you know, synchronizing, checking, terminated, all of that. And then we have this higher level parallel programming library uh, that we've introduced that gives you much more functionality in the world of tasks, uh, uh, parallel fours, and, and so on. Um, and so this application, I'll just run it um, so you can visually see what happens. It starts up a thread for each of the sort algorithms. First, we generate random numbers and, and do paint, line, paint lines so that you can see the values rather than just having a linear list of numbers, for example. And then we click Start Sorting. You can visually see the speed of each of these threads getting started and quick sorts faster, selection sorts next, and so on. If we go under, uh, in this covers, there's a, a synchronized, because we need to be able to swap so that we can paint in the paint boxes of each to, of the progress of the of the sorts. So the visual swap uh, up here just lets us paint in the different whatever uh, box for each sort. And we need to synchronize those set so that uh, because the VCL is not thread safe, so that we can uh, take the values of each of the lines and keep repainting them along the way. So that was the early days of uh, of threading. And, and again, all of this is inside of the, the system classes HPP files, so synchronizes here, uh, queuing things and so on. And then, uh, and you know, it's all part of the tthread class. All right. So next incarnation of this now was to use the parallel programming library. So let's take a look at, uh, at this one. There's, there's two different versions of this. This uses a parallel four. And uh, so on the button click, I'm going to use, use t the tparallel class, which is in the system threading library, system threading.hpp. And, uh, and then uh, we're going to use the parallel, the for method as part of the parallel for. This takes several parameters, uh, you know, if there's an owner, uh, uh, the beginning and end uh, iterator value, so one to max, in this case max is 50,000, and then it, it, it needs an iterator event, or that's one of the options, is to pass something that has what looks like an event handler. It has a sender, and it has the value of an index. So I declare my iterator event up here, and give it that same under the cover signature. Uh, and then inside of this, I can run my method is prime passing the index and the is prime is the same method I can use uh, whether it's a parallel prime number generator or on button one click I just call is prime in a uh, in a sequential way and that should take longer instead of firing up all the cores and so this is the brute force uh, test for prime numbers to see if uh, if it's divisible by something, and if and if if it is, then it, and it's not a prime number, then break out and the, and return the bool as false. And so that on button one is the sequential version. Uh, fine, it runs. The the parallel version we call parallel four. So let me uncomment this out because I want to show you that parallel four has several different variations. So we can we can actually hit space and see things that are here. Uh, there's a loop state, loop resort, uh, iterator event, um, you know, 64-bit precision or not, and then there's you know the rest of the constructors and so on. But there's that parallel four method. So let's go again and put four there and uh, and look at it. And then these are all the different variations for parallel four. Uh, and so there, it's an overloaded method where you can just pass an iterator event. Uh, that's the first one up there on the screen. Uh, there's some other, uh, and there's the low and high values that we're passing to it. 
if you want to have a thread pool, you can pass that as an optional parameter at the end. Um, then down the way, there's uh, you can have a stride, which is how, how long things happen in which threads. It helps you identify uh, which parts of the parallel four are going to run in a certain thread or a couple of them in a thread and so on. You can also, there's an interface for for tasks, and we'll get to that in a minute. So there's different variations of things that are inside of the Parallel 4. And so let's just take a look at this. Oh, I should mention one other thing. There's this T-Interlocked class. And T-Interlocked uh, allows you in a, in a threaded application to do certain operations like increment uh, a value. And this, this tote is just a global variable defined in the form. We can go and look. It should be over there in the... In the in the pub in this case it's in the public section so uh, it's a form variable and we can use that to increment the number of primes that we find so if it is a prime then we're going to update from any of the threads uh, that total value of primes found and we use this interlocked uh, class the increment method. So let me uncomment this for a moment and we'll take a look at uh, at what we can do. So there's all sorts of methods in T-interlock, increment, decrement, uh, you know, do some testing, uh, exchanging values, adding a value, and then there's the rest of the, the you know, things that involve instances and so on. So it's a nice little class that's that you can use inside of a thread to do things like, uh, you know, count numbers and so on, add numbers together and such. Very simple, and then you can extend it in the usual uh, inheritance way to add other kinds of functionality as well. All right, so let's take a look at, this is the uh, VCL version, so we'll, uh, we'll just run this one. And this one, I guess, is a 64-bit Windows version. So if I click on button one, it's going to run the sequential. and says, OK, out of 50,000 numbers, it found 5,134 primes, and it took 434 milliseconds. Clicking button two, which will run the parallel version, it said, OK, we found the same number of primes, but it took one-fourth of the time. It took 123 milliseconds. And again, depending on what's going on in my machine, I'm running in a VM where I have four cores assigned. My MacBook Pro has eight cores. Uh, in my VM here, I've, I've set it up to give uh, this Windows 10 VM four of those eight cores so that I can run other VMs and, and there do their thing. We can do the same thing in, uh, in FireMonkey. And so in FireMonkey, we can then run the application in uh, on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, and this is just the same application. The only difference is that uh, it's using a FireMonkey form, uh, but it's used the same code. I've got my memo, I've got my buttons, the exact same code. Here's the sequential version, uh, again, for the loop, and here's the, the parallel version. So this one, let's just run on, uh, we can run this on OS X, for example, if I start up my PA server. Let's uh, make sure that's running. And the first time you run it after you start up, uh, you have to tell the Macintosh that it's OK for this process to, to get at the tools API. So my IP address may have changed for my connection. Let's copy that. And let's go back to uh, our ID. And let's make sure our connection is correct. OK, it looks like it's the same. I'll just, just to be sure, test the connection. It's all good. All right, so the same code. This time, FireMonkey, again, the parallel programming library, and tthread uh, class, all of those are available across all the platforms that we support. So let's go and uh, build this one for OS X, make sure it's all OK. And then we'll say, OK, linking, that's all good. And let's say run. And then it should switch over. And everybody sees that. So now I've got my for loop here. And it found 5,134 primes. That's good. 
And in this case, I'm not in my VM. I'm, I've got all the cores, so it can run even faster. Right? All right. And then, but it still finds the right primes. That's a good one. That's a good thing. And then finally, I wanted to show, and I showed this the other day. Um, this is using the task run and the t-task uh, class. And I'm passing a, a lambda uh, into the run. And then inside of here, I'm doing a thread synchronize. And the reason I, and I pass a lambda to that one, because I want to, inside of this uh, task run, I want to be able to update the user interface to say, is it working or is it done? Uh, the capture variables I need to, to pass into the lambda, the this pointer, so it can know about memo one uh, that is in the user interface. And the iterator here, uh, I, I need to pass that in so that I can do the test of what's going on uh, right there. And so this example can run on, it's a FireMonkey example, it can run on, uh, on all the different platforms. And then I have button two, which is not in the task run, and it's just going to output the current value that I am uh, updating along the way. Now I, I commented out the t-task here again, because I wanted to go and show you what's available on the t-task. Uh, so we have run, we can wait for any other tasks that might be running. If we start up multiple tasks, wait for any of those. There's uh, wait for all down here. We can go and check the status of each of the tasks, for example, and see are the, is it running, is it is it stopped, is it completed. So let's uh, run this one, Win32 is fine, just so we can watch. So here we're just showing the value. Right, we're just hitting and clicking the, the show value, but let's run the background task. Now it's running and sleeping, working away. That's, that's that call to thread synchronize so we can write to the user interface. Show value is just dumping out, uh, oh, three times. Okay, that's fine. I, I was playing around with this program. And then it's all done, and we see the final value. There was so much to cover in this C++ migration webinar. There's lots more in 10 Seattle that you can take advantage of. Uh, MongoDB NoSQL support, uh, adding app analytics to figure out and track what's happening in your deployed applications, using beacons and beacon fence for proximity-based applications, dealing with Bluetooth and Internet of Things devices, doing multi-tier with DataSnap and the Enterprise Mobility Services, uh, enhancing your applications with the Kanopka Signature VCL controls, tracking what's happening inside of your applications during debugging time using CodeSight Studio and the RAD Solution Pack that's available for VCL and FireMonkey. We have Code Rage sessions in the C++ track for all of these topics, so you can take a look at those. The benefits of moving to C++ Builder 10 Seattle, besides just getting the C++ 11 language on 32-bit, 64-bit Windows, iOS, and Android, it's the fastest way to build visually engaging applications, great-looking user interfaces for Windows 10, for Mac, and for mobile, and build applications that still run on Windows 7 and Windows 8 as well. You can build hyper-connected applications by using Bluetooth, app tethering through TCP IP, doing beacons and the Internet of Things, do your database access in the cloud on remote SQL databases. And then with Windows 10 support, you can move your applications forward. More than 1.3 million developers have embraced Windows 10. They're building applications for their users for today and for the future. And C++ Builder 10 Seattle has the WinRT support, the components and new VCL controls and styles so that you can get going on Windows 10 today, have your applications built for your users, for your customers. We have several special offers here at the end of the year. Purchase a new user license or upgrade of RAD Studio 10 or C++ Builder 10 Architect Edition between November 11th and December 18th, and you'll receive the VCL Solution Pack for free. No waiting. Once you order confirmation comes through, you download your free products. Check out the information at EmbarkedArrow.com slash RADOffer. The second special offer, if you purchase a new user license or upgrade, Rad Studio 10 Seattle or C++ Builder 10 Seattle, the professional, enterprise, or ultimate edition between November 11th and December 18th, 
you'll receive the Kanopka Signature VCL controls and CodeSight Studio 5. As soon as you receive the order confirmation, you can download your free products. Again, the information is at Embarcadero.com slash rad offer. The third special offer is if you have any earlier version of Rad Studio or C++ Builder, you can qualify for the upgrade price if you purchase update subscription. So purchase 10 Seattle at the upgrade price through December 31st, add update subscription, and you'll get that discount. Again, all the information is on Embarcadero.com slash rad offer. If you upgrade or purchase Rad Studio 10 or C++ Builder 10 Seattle, you'll get the free bonus pack, the VCL and FireMonkey premium styles, the Meta Converter Basic, which will convert your VCL forms to FireMonkey forms. And also, you'll get the new Object Pascal Handbook by Marco Cantu. Go to Embarcadero.com slash rad offer. There's many more aspects specific to your needs. We'd like to hear from you about other things we can do to help you migrate your C++ Builder projects forward. So let's have your questions. Okay, and I am online with... Al Manorino and Jim McKeith, are you guys there? I'm here. And Al? Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, there were lots of great questions um, along the way. Um, some very large projects that are either taking longer to build and or are having issues on older versions of CBuilder going back to XC3. And I've, we've replied that we, we want to help track down one of the things in these migration activities that we think about is is taking real customer samples and helping migrate them. So I've sent emails or I've sent posted notes about sending us emails and so that we can work with you and, and hopefully with your permission we can document the steps so that in the new year in 2016 we can do more migration webinars using real customer examples. We'll, we can hide the code and do whatever, uh, but we want to help you move your projects forward. We're not consultants in that respect, but I think the shared learning that can help everybody in moving, you know, projects forward, larger projects forward, uh, will be great. Larger, maybe also including their use of lots of third-party components, database connections, and so on, versus number of lines of code. So you can send us emails, uh, Al and myself's emails on the screen. Uh, we'd love to uh, see what you're doing and see if we can uh, uh, use some of your sample projects as migration studies uh, for future webinars. This one was a, a very general overview focused a lot on uh, Unicode migration because we've done surveys that show that some of the C++ Builder developers are still using C Builder 6 or, or C++ Builder 2007 or not using some of the newer capabilities in the latest compilers. There were a couple of comments about linker capacity, even though the ID in 10 Seattle is a large memory ID, it's got up to four gig of memory. That's for all of the IDE uh, work that you're doing and all the tools and plugins and designers and things that you might brought in so that we can have more space for your so large source code projects. There's still uh, some issues in the in the linker capacity, both the integrated linker uh, and then uh, we also and you'll sometimes get notices on build that uh, to try using the out of process or the command line linker versus the, the integrated iLink uh, 32. We have a 64-bit linker that, that isn't a 64-bit capacity linker. It's a linker for develop for creating 64-bit executables and DLLs and so on on Windows. So uh, one of the guidance that we try to give, and I put some links as well uh, for out of, out of memory as it relates to linker, specifically in C++ projects, versus out of memory in the IDE build and, and working process that we've enhanced. And there's more work to be done, but there's some things you can do in, in linker options, turning off debug information for some units and so on, splitting some larger units up that may have more complex use of templates and, and symbols that explode the, the debug and in-memory space. Uh, so there's always more to be done, and we want to understand the profile of those kinds of projects and make sure we pass that along to the, the compiler and tool team who are working on future versions 
of the compilers and linkers and also pass along to the to the ID team. Although in 10 Seattle, the ID team is, has done a big amount of work with unit caching and the large four gigabyte memory model. Anything else to add, Jim or Al, to that conversation about capacity and size and linking and compiling? Uh, not for me. Okay. There was a question about the uh, speed of compiling on the old classic compiler versus the Clang Enhanced compilers, and I, and I replied that, number one, the old classic compiler only did, I think, nine C++ language feature things. Uh, we called it C++0x. It was one of the early on uh, steps along the way to what became and is now known as C++11 and then the maintenance release that's Happen, that's happening right now for, for C++14, and then the work that's going on for C++17. So uh, the Clang Enhanced Compiler has to do much more work. It's dealing with much more complex and larger C++ language. And so there's a few things that you can do. Uh, you can turn off optimizations uh, to get some speed enhancement or turn off specific ones or all of them on the Clang Enhanced Compilers. The other thing is that we've added in 10 Seattle the parallel compilation, and I put the link to that. There's a project, there's two project options you set, and those are documented in the doc wiki to allow you to use multiple cores, and you can choose the number of cores if you have multiple cores available, where it'll compile different parts of a, of a larger project uh, using the parallel compilation capability of the Kling Enhanced Compilers. So I put that link in there to give you uh, additional speed. As far as IDE Insight, uh, right now we're still using IDE Insight using the old uh, classic compiler, but there's work going on to allow uh, ID Insight to work with uh, with the newer uh, Clang enhanced compilers, as well as there's work going on on newer releases of the Clang uh, enhanced compilers. Right now, we're on a combination of 3.1 and 3.3, depending on the platform, and those are documented in the doc wiki and and the links in my blog post, which I updated today. I've got links to different parts of the of, uh, the compilers and VCL and FireMonkey and Windows 10. So if you go back to the to my blog post, which I put in the chat window, uh, you'll see some of the links appearing down below the uh, the information about the event itself. So there's lots of resource links and some of the links that I mentioned in the Q&A log and that Al and Jim have mentioned uh, are added to that blog post and we'll keep adding um, more things to help you based on the comments and questions you're putting in. Let's see. There was one, I, I've got to research a little more about why there was, there was a message or note about uh, using the Clang Enhanced Compiler when you want to do a make versus a, the ID just does a build. Uh, so I'm, I need to explore a little further why make is not happening in your case, only compiling the changed files. Uh, unless it's a header file that's used by all of your all of your files, then uh, then of course if you change a header file that's that's touched, uh, there has to be some compiling that that needs to be done on all the files that use it. But uh, otherwise, I I can't think of a specific setting that would cause a build all, every time. I haven't seen that myself, but uh, I'm going to do some more research there. Let's see. If you haven't tried C++ Builder 10 Seattle on your code, you can download the free trial. It's a 30-day trial. You just download it, install it. It can run side by side with other versions of C++ Builder. So if you're seeing something you might want to try on the latest compiler and the latest language support, you can download the free trial and, and run your projects through it. Uh, there were some people who had issues where they migrated a project. I've had this where I migrated a C Builder 6 project to 2007, to 2009, uh, to XE 3, 5, whatever. And somewhere along the way, something happens. Don't know what. Maybe the project file gets uh, corrupted somehow. And so what we usually tell people at that point in time is to create a new project, uh, remove the, the unit 1 that gets generated, and add your units and, and files to that project, and then do a build and see if that gets you past a problem. 
that might be happening. Um, we moved along the way from, I forget when it was, we moved to MS Build XML format, but we we migrate the projects along the way. Uh, somebody had mentioned about IDE settings, and 10 Seattle now has, and I forget Jim or Al if it was in XE8, but 10 Seattle has the ability to extract or export the the registry settings from past versions in the registry um, and create an ID settings file and then when you install a newer version of the ID you can import all your settings for colors and other kinds of things uh, into uh, the new version or, or and you can also copy the ID settings to another computer and import it to that other computer so you don't have to go through all your settings that way so check out the ID settings export and import capability that is included. There were some questions about can you connect clients to 64-bit data snap servers, 32-bit uh, clients, console clients, whatever. There was one about 16-bit client. I haven't tried that. I haven't thought 16-bit in a long time. There was the question, well, if your data snap server is doing TCP, HTTP, or HTTPS, and it's doing method calls through those mechanisms and getting data back, you know, return values. Um, if your 16-bit client can make those TCP, HTTP, HTTPS calls and can deal with the data coming back, data streams um, for your data snap methods that you uh, that you publicize, then uh, have at it. But uh, mixing 64-bit servers and 32-bit clients, perfectly fine. Uh, they're running in different processes, so having a 32-bit client calling a data snap server is running 64-bit on the same machine, a different machine, and so on, uh, all good. Uh, for for your libraries and your DLLs, though, you'll need 32-bit and or 64-bit versions of those. So if you've got a, a, a library DLL, you've got to build those versions. We do that in, in C++ Builder itself. Uh, we ship both the 32-bit and 64-bit windows libraries. We ship the the Android, iOS, and OS 10 libraries uh, that you can link with based on when you choose the project uh, platform target. And so you need to do the same thing. Uh, also, make sure of your library paths and that you have the the right binary files, the right library files uh, in the paths that your project is, is working on. When I showed you how to choose the classic compiler or the Clang Enhanced compiler uh, in that project option, all that does is we'll launch a different compiler, but make sure that on your library path you have the, the Clang built, Clang Enhanced built libraries and object files and that you have the classic built. Uh, we had one C++ developer, not on this webinar, who had not updated their library paths, and so it wasn't able to find uh, the Clang Enhanced built version of some some libraries and some uh, some source files uh, because of the path. So it doesn't automatically know where you've put those. Uh, if best to put those files uh, in the in the same directories between the classic 32-bit Windows compiler and the Clang Enhanced 32-bit Windows compiler or make sure that the correct files can be found along your, your again, library path. Um, let's see. Uh, app tethering, which we showed, uh, can uh, is included in the Pro Edition uh, for desktop for C++ Builder. If you want to do desktop to mobile tethering, then you either need Red Studio Pro or the Enterprise or mobile add-on. Uh, if you want to do app tethering on non-desktop uh, or between desktop and mobile applications. But app tethering is a great way to leave existing projects, as Al showed, VCL or FireMonkey projects, and not have to touch them other than building them uh, using the app tethering components, and then build some new functionality in another application VCL or FireMonkey, and uh, and then send actions and send data, receive data back and forth uh, to enhance uh, and or control uh, 
your applications that you're moving forward. We don't have app tethering for old builds, so it's not easy to to just drag and drop the components. The app tethering supports specific versions uh, because of the runtime library that comes with it. But uh, it's an interesting and usable way to enhance existing applications rather than migrating them completely over. Let's see, there was a question about long double. And as far as I can tell, long double is available on on all the Clang enhanced compilers. Uh, there is a question about uh, extended or, or floating point on 64-bit windows specifically. We use um, Microsoft's only supports the 10-byte floating point format on 64-bit windows. Uh, uh, what's it called? The extended uh, 80 uh, rec, I think it's called, extended 80 REC. Uh, that's a 10-byte floating point value. So that's happening under the covers as Windows 64 gets to the floating point processor and back. At least that's my uh, memory about that. Uh, there was a question about uh, using parallel for database queries. And I sort of queried back, and maybe Jim or Al, you've got some ideas. Uh, if you've got multiple threads firing off database queries, uh, from a client application, um, you may be running into whatever SQL database you're using on the back end um, where it can only handle one request at a time, or uh, if you've got one database connection uh, and you're funneling multiple queries through, uh, then you've got your connection count as it relates to the client connected to the SQL database or database back end. So, uh, I'm not sure what. Well, and you're asking, Go ahead. Your, your connection library to make sure that you're following the rules it has about uh, being thread safe. Because if you're using the same connection or sharing connections between threads, there's uh, concerns about how you're going to deal with that. Yeah. So uh, if it is a multi threaded, if the database is able to support multiple connections, which, unless it's like a, a desktop database or an embedded database, usually you can have multiple connections. Uh, then usually you're okay with that, but you just want to make sure that you're following the uh, best practices for the threading library that you're currently using. And they came, so, yeah, they came back and said it was they're using they're using Postgres and it's configured for 500 parallel connections and 32 on one IP address. So we'll have to research a little further with uh, Dimitri and the Fire and Act team. If you're using Fire DAC, that might be the next question: is what are you using to connect? As Jim was talking about. Sorry for jumping in. I just found the... That's right. I'll put the link here for FireDAC multi-threading for you for the doc wiki. Okay. Um, and it's FireDAC. Will... It's FireDAC on 64. Okay. So. All right. I'll put this link in here then. There you go. So that talks about um, how to use FireDeck in a multi-threaded environment. Okay, and then there was a question here. Uh, if you install CBuilder 10 on Win 8.1, which is fine, you can run CBuilder 10 on Win 8.1. I, I run it on Windows 7 and Windows 10. You won't have to reinstall if you upgrade your Windows 8 to Windows 10. I, I've been through that. I went from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and Windows 8.1 to Windows 10. So it preserves all your settings and your installed applications. So uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, if you go to a new machine, of course, then you need to install CBuilder 10 again. But uh, uh, not a problem installing CBuilder 10 on Windows 7, 8, 1, or 10. And again, if you migrate that machine to Windows 10, uh, CBuilder 10 will just keep working. Uh, why does the install with save files off by default? Um, I'm not sure if you're asking. Uh, some people don't like autosave. Uh, we do have, in, in 10 Seattle, we have this recovery process. So if, if something happens to your hardware, it crashes, there's a periodic save that happens, and that's the recovery file. Uh, maybe you're doing something else in a separate process, and you crash your machine, and you haven't saved often. So there's... 
uh, we've left it to each uh, user to decide what level of saving they want, uh, and those are in the in the tools options for the development environment. So you can uh, it's uh, I'll just say customer choice to that one. Uh, but first thing you want to do is turn those on or off. Yeah, and then with settings migration, once you set those, just migrate the settings across and you don't have to worry about, you know, tweaking it to your particular preference. Just keep rolling your settings forward and it's like you don't care anymore. Okay. Let's see if I've missed anything. Again, going back to depending on which compilers you're using, um, it's really nothing to do with whether you're using a 32-bit or 64-bit version of Windows. It's if you're, as far as compile time, it's which compilers you're using, the classic compiler, which doesn't have as much C++, versus the Clang Enhanced compiler. So if you're using the Clang Enhanced compilers, whether that's on 32-bit Windows or 64-bit Windows, um, you know, the compile speed is related to the compile and optimization linking speed is related to uh, which compilers you're using. Uh, and again, if it's a Clang Enhanced compiler, check out the parallel parallel programming, uh, sorry, the parallel comp compilation uh, feature that's available if you've got a multi-core hardware machine. Okay. And again, if you have uh, projects that you want us to help uh, guide you through migration. Uh, again, we're looking for all sorts of different aspects of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, so that we can uh, follow up and do additional migration webinars in 2016. Uh, so send us emails, send to Al and myself. Uh, we're not consultants to take you through every piece of source code, but at the same time, uh, we can learn from uh, the steps that that you're going through or need to go through to move to 10 Seattle and use that as content for future migration webinars. I've written a bunch of notes about other things like migrating from DB Express to FireDAC for C++ Builder, uh, using the Meta Converter to convert your VCL forms to FireMonkey forms in your C++ projects. And so I've got probably eight or ten sort of subtopics that we couldn't cover this time. We really wanted to help get everybody across the Unicode chasm and, and from 32 to 64-bit. Um, but there's more in moving to from desktop to mobile. Uh, so we have lots of topics. You can send us emails with the topics for migration uh, aspects that you'd like to see us do. If you have some projects that are that you see out there somewhere, maybe not your your you know uh, secret projects or your customer or company private projects uh, that you think are representative of a larger class of C++ builder project, maybe some open source projects, maybe an accounting system or something, uh, send us an email with links to the GitHub or Subversion or wherever the repository is, and and we can look to see about some of those and using those as the migration uh, samples or demos. So um, let's see, there's here, we're converting from CBuilder 6 to XE6, so we finish that before converting to Seattle. Uh, Al, do you have advice there or Jim? For me, uh, between XE6 and Seattle, um, I would just go to Seattle, there's, you know, but it depends on if there's features in XE6 or that you're moving um, that might get complicated I've, for Seattle, but I can't think of anything. I've heard that... Um, yeah, uh, Jim, you can start first. I was going to say, I've, I've talked to some of the MVPs that have been involved in some of these conversion projects, and they frequently recommend going to right before Unicode, if you got like really old stuff like it, uh, from C Builder 6, go to uh, right before the Unicode release, and then make the Unicode jump, and then go all the way forward. And so that way, 
you know, there's some other subtle things that happened, you know, small things, but then Unicode's kind of the bigger one, and you make that jump just to one step and then go all the way up. Um, and that way it's a little bit easier to deal with smaller chunks, as it were. Yeah, sounds like sounds like you know sound advice. You know, from my experience with the with the Unicode migrations, you know, for the most part, the uh, the older you know, C plus plus builder source code, the, the forms, they're going to import, they're going to compile, they're going to link, and and for the most part, they might execute in the new 10 Seattle. But uh, you may need to make some Unicode changes, and for sure, you're going to have to rebuild those third-party libraries. So that is an is an issue right there. If you're going to go from Builder 6 to XE6, you're first going to have to rebuild any of those third-party libraries you have in XE6, and then you're going to have to do it again in 10 Seattle. So that you'll have to think about. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, look at the code and make sure you're not making any assumptions about pointer or integer byte sizes. I think David spoke about that in this uh, in this session. And any strings that interact with the VCL, uh, you got to make sure those are Unicode aware. So those are kind of the big ones you'll have to deal with. Yeah, a lot of it depends on what your project is and uh, stuff like that. So if it's if you're using all off-the-shelf third-party components, and those third-party components are already upgraded to 10 Seattle, and you're not getting, you know, sticking bytes in uh, strings then you probably can just go straight to Seattle and it'll probably be fine. But it, you really need to kind of do a little assessment of what what your code looks like and what's going on with your project to, to make that best decision. Yeah, and I, uh, I I put that as a note. You can always send me an email if you, with some of the particulars of of what you're using. Again, if it, it also depends on how far along in converting from Builder 6 to XE6, for example. I, the only thing I could note that's different between XE6 at the Windows level and 10 Seattle is the is the use is the support we have now for Clang enhanced compiler uh, for Win32 that was new in in 10 Seattle. Uh, if you're just using the classic compiler and it's a VCL with X number of other components and libraries, uh, unless there's something that, as Jim mentioned. Uh, isn't supported in 10 Seattle, but is in XE6, then you're already making that leap across the Unicode um, that was that was switched over in C Builder in 2009. So um, don't see much. I'll have to go back and look if there was anything else that pops out where where something was changed between XE6 and 10 Seattle. The Doc Wiki again has all those links on the left hand side. Once you're at the Doc Wiki on the past versions. I think going back to 2010, maybe, um, but you can see for XZ6, XZ7, XZ8, and 10 Seattle what's new, and see if any of the things in the what's new or what's changed uh, might cause some heartburn in the conversion. But uh, send me an email; we can uh, take a look at some of the aspects of your project. But uh, just seems like 10 Seattle should be okay. Uh, versus XZ6. Uh, there's nothing just big that, that comes to mind as a major breaking change. So, and that's where this whole, <clears throat> I almost wanted to create a matrix or, or a decision cube of uh, which version you're using and where you want to go based on all those criteria I put at the beginning, ID, plugins, third-party components, libraries, and so on and say, okay, if you have this, this, and this, and you want to go from that version to that version, here's the things you have to do, uh, which would be uh, an enormous uh, task other than general guidance, which is what we have on the doc wiki with Unicode, all the things I'll cover, 32-bit to 64-bit windows and so on. All of those things are, are documented with guidance. Uh, and I've put uh, and added some more links uh, into my blog post that, again, I'll put... Uh, Let's see, somewhere, uh, let's put it in the chat window again. I'll just put it in there again in case you didn't get it. Uh, that's the announcement of the this webinar that was on our, uh, on my doc wiki, sorry, on my blog. Um, and so there's lots of links to doc wiki entries uh, and so on that are added at the bottom of my blog post about this event. Uh, let's see, so there is a question about 
What about 64-bit compilation for OS X? Uh, the team is looking at it. The team has been busy doing iOS 64, uh, getting the Clang compiler for Win32 in 10 Seattle. Uh, they definitely want to have the same C++11 support with later versions of the Clang enhanced compilers uh, supporting all the platforms that you ha we have, uh, including OS X. So it's not available yet, uh, but we'll keep you all posted uh, as the team moves on. They're also looking at, at Linux for the future, Linux server, and being able to take C++ Builder uh, uh, server-side you know, apps onto, onto Linux 64-bit as well. Let's see, third-party but it's the, the turbo power, uh, some of the turbo power are there in Get It. So if you have 10 Seattle, go under Tools, Get It Package Manager, uh, and you'll see some of the turbo power controls have been ported over, and you should be able to use those uh, with uh, C++ Builder 10 Seattle. Uh, Delphi Gems, I'm not sure of, but it's great to have those. I will find out and we'll add links. Uh, into the blog post. Uh, oh, I should put that blog post. I think I put it in the chat window. Uh, I've updated my blog post. I'll put it again just in case. And so I'm using the, the blog post that I did to add links for additional information. So I will I will go and look and see it about Delphi Gems and see if those are have been built supporting uh, 10 Seattle. Uh, some of the Turbo Power pieces are up there. Uh, and so again, look at tools, get it package manager for, uh, the, for the turbo power pieces, lockbox and other things. So as far as the boost libraries, yeah, the boost support we have right now is, that, is as I listed, the team is, is, ta is looking to take additional versions of boost in every release um, to make sure that it works with, uh, with our compilers across all the plat uh, across all the platforms right now. Uh, Win32 and Win64. I think there was a an open source project that also brought Boost, and that should be in uh, in Get It Package Manager as well. Let me uh, remind myself of that. So yeah, so Boost on the Clang enhanced compilers for 64-bit Windows is 1.55.0 on 32-bit Classic compiler 1.39.0. Uh, on Android, 1.53.0, but uh, let me bring up the IDE. So is it the full suite? Uh, not yet, but that's a work in progress. So and I showed, I mentioned the WinRT for C++10 here. Let me bring up the IDE. Um, hopefully you're seeing that. Um, so here's some of the turbo power pieces are there. Uh, here's the WinRT for C++, that's in the package manager. Uh, here's the, uh, from us, 139 and 155, you can grab those uh, from there. Another one, a oh, virtual tree from the uh, version 6.0 for VCL is there from the uh, Turbo Pack, or the, we call it the Turbo Pack, but Turbo Power software. So you can grab that one uh, using uh, 10 Seattle IDE. Um, get it package manager and there's more showing up all the time so keep going back uh, it's a separate process where as we validate uh, some of these like the Jedi code library and so on that they work uh, then they get added to the server side and they show up so it'll always when you go and bring up the package manager you'll get whatever is available uh, out on our server that you can choose to install turbo power it depends so the question about turbo power uh, purely VCL are available for FMX. It depends if it's a visual control like the tree view, then that's a, it's VCL. If it's non-visual controls like like lockbox, then you need to go and look and see what they've been done. So here, for example, lockbox VCL and FireMonkey um, for lockbox version two, and then there's a specific lockbox uh, version for FMX. So it depends on each of the libraries and the if they're open source, for example, who's doing the work. So uh, if VCL based, then of course, if non-visual, check, get it, package manager for platform support.
Okay. So here again, lockbox there uh, works with Delphi and C++ and Win32, Win64, Android, and OS X have been tested currently. Uh, I don't see iOS there, so. But uh, these are works in progress by open source community members, in, in particular, uh, I think it was Roman that was doing the work to make sure these uh, turbo power pieces have been brought up to 10 Seattle. So uh, keep checking back, and you can, uh, Go to those project pages just by searching in Google and post comments and, and questions as well. Uh, Async Pro, I believe, is Windows only. Yeah, I don't think Async Pro has Async Pro been hasn't been ported, it looks like. Um, oh Async Pro. Async Pro is is Windows only, so it's Win32 and Win64. Uh, Win only because it uses the Windows API, the COM communication ports API. It'd be great to have Async Pro supporting the different underlying uh, RTL for doing communication, but uh, no, no problem showing you, Chris. Okay. And again, send us email, uh, let's see, to Al and myself. Let me go back here. Also, I'll put... Uh, Additional information here in the blog post, you'll see the links about to just general language capability and library links, um, that directory search, uh, Unicode support came from Al's section. Um, if you want to move uh, your code from desktop to mobile, there's some notes on the doc wiki there about the new VCL controls and support with FireMonkey for Windows 10. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, VCL and FireMonkey, uh, maybe you want to do some things side by side. They have different form for, form formats. I can't say that easily, can I? Um, so you have different projects, or you could just switch to FMX. Uh, the Meta Converter will convert your forms from VCL to FireMonkey. It will also add live bindings if you've got data access components and so on. Uh, then you go and do whatever changes you have to do to uh, to code behind. Let's see. Uh, oh, so on the T task in the parallel programming library, uh, there is a thread pool you can use. And the documentation, let's see where, I think uh, I didn't put parallel programming library, but I'll, uh, I'll add the uh, parallel programming library there. I'm going to do a blog post today. Uh, we've got support in 10 Seattle that makes it easier to use um, lambdas uh, for both the, the task run for parallel four and how to use futures by going through an, an interface that takes a type uh, because the underlying uh, parallel programming library was writ written uh, in Delphi uses Delphi generics and, and interfaces. So those are all there. I showed you some of the examples. I'm going to blog today, I, that's my goal, um, to show you how to use a Lambda in the case of the parallel for loop. In the one that I showed, I was using an external event uh, method and passing that as that's one of the parameters that you can pass to a parallel for. So it looked for that event signature uh, to, to match. But now in 10 Seattle, we have some helper uh, templates that allow you to use lambdas in a parallel four uh, loop uh, method as well. So I've got that working, uh, taking the same, I showed you the prime number generator that was using that iterator event signature. I now have it working in 10 Seattle with uh, with a Lambda, so that'll run on again, wherever there's a Clang Enhanced Compiler, Win32, Win64, iOS and Android for now, and then uh, again, the goal is to have Clang Enhanced Compilers across all the platforms, including OS X. And currently, the, we use the classic compiler, and it's 32-bit only uh, currently, but again, the team is uh, looking at all of that for the future. Uh, Clang, let's see, you can use 
You can use the classic compiler with the parallel programming library. You just can't use Lambda. So as long as you use uh, um, the right signatures, and you know, event iterator, for example, for parallel four, or you can use uh, and you can use TTAS. You can't use futures in the classic compiler, I believe. I'll have to double check. But let me uh, put a blog post to make sure uh, which of the parallel programming library capabilities can work with the classic compiler versus the Clang, Clang enhanced compiler. So for me, if you're going to use lambdas or anything else in your programs that are beyond just the C++0x capabilities, like I showed with auto and so on, you need the Clang Enhanced Compiler, but you can use PPL, the Parallel Programming Library, with the Classic Compiler. Uh, we have samples uh, doing that, as long as you don't use a Lambda. Okay. So when you drop down uh, or type in uh, TTAS colon colon run, and then you put the parenthesis, it'll show you all of the different variations of, of the task run parameters, and as long as uh, and you can do all of that again through uh, using the interfaces and the parameters that match. So I don't believe there's it. I think futures is maybe the only one that needs 10 Seattle, but I haven't tried futures on the classic compiler. I've only been playing with them on the Clang Enhanced compiler. So I need to go back and and rip out the lambdas and put in a, a iterator event or or an event. A method signature and do a quick test. So I'll, uh, it'll be great blog fodder uh, for C++ with the parallel programming library. Uh, and, and the question here about our tests instantiated as threads, yes they are under the covers. So it's system, it's the system threading name scope uh, and underneath the covers, they're going on each of the platforms. The Parallel Programming Library runs on Windows, uh, OS X, iOS, and Android. And under the covers, we're using the, the threading APIs on each of the platforms. Uh, it just gives you a nice, I think the way to look at it is it gives you a nice way to use these higher level constructs of a parallel for loop, task management, and, and the futures. So, um, but yes, under the cover, it has to go through the operating system to get to the hardware, to get to the cores, right, or the processor. So there's no magic that way. It just gives you a cleaner, nicer way to do things like task management, like the, the wait for all of them to, to complete or to uh, pause or stop a, th a task and, and get the status of tests and so on. So uh, the great thing is that it works across all the platforms. Uh, that we support with our compilers. Okay, Al, do you have anything to add before we uh, we shut down this version here at the top of the hour? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Well, at least for my part on the on the Unicode migra uh, migration, uh, if you have not started it yet or started it yet, uh, you're going to probably find out that for the most part. Your, your older C++ builder source code and your forms, they should just import, import, compile, link, and execute in the, in the current 10 Seattle. Uh, the two things you're going to have to worry about or look at is any of these uh, third-party libraries you might have. Those all have to be rebuilt in the 10 Seattle, so you can use them in a 10 Seattle project. And depending on how you're using strings and chars uh, in your application, you may need you may need to make some Unicode changes. But like I said, it, Embarcadero is here to help. So if you're doing these Unicode migrations and you you get stuck somewhere with like one of those error messages we saw, like I don't know how to convert a uh, a char to a white white char underscore t, and you're just not sure how to change the code uh, to make it Unicode, you know, best thing to do is you know send us a screenshot of what you're looking at and uh, we should be able to help you on what you need to do to change it to get it converted over to Unicode. And I'm going to put in uh, somewhere here, uh, I'll put in a link, I'll put it in the chat window as well. Al recently did a blog post about migrating, here I'll bring it up on the screen, uh, migrating legacy C Builder apps to 10 Seattle and he's got uh, 
migration considerations and links and so on. If you don't have 10 Seattle, a uh, great thing you can do if you want to check it out and try porting a project uh, is download the free trial. You get 30 day free trial. Uh, install the trial. It installs alongside your other C++ builder versions and just throw the project at it and uh, and see what uh, what happens and then let us know um, so that we can uh, so that we can iterate with you and we want to do some more of these migration webinars in the new year uh, specifically focused on some of the capabilities that and and challenges that some of you might be facing uh, as as you're trying to move your projects forward. There's a lot of shared learning that we can leverage with your permission, without giving away you know company secrets or or other kinds of things. So if you want to, uh, I just wanted to bring up our email addresses again as well. Uh, if you want to share some of the information or guide us, help have us help guide you through some of the migration process, um, then uh, absolutely contact us. Our, there's our email addresses, al.manorino at embarcador.com. I think I spelled it right. And David I at embarcador.com. And we'll, uh, we'll work together to see if we can capture additional best practices in migration um, and share that uh, in future webinars and blog posts as well. So just want to thank Al for the, the work he did on putting all this Unicode. We, you know, we did all of this originally back in 2008, the year 2008, on the 2009 release. And we had to go back and remind ourselves because, you know, we've, we did a lot of that over about a year and a half's time helping people move forward. And then we moved on to mobile and other things. Um, and so coming back to this is perfect time especially now because of Windows 10, uh, as well as the platform support that we're doing. So helping you and other C++ customers uh, move forward with your projects is a good thing. If you've crossed the Unicode chasm, it might be uh, taking advantage of new capabilities in all the versions. And as I mentioned, if you go to the doc wiki, on the left-hand side, going back to, I think, the 2010 release, there's all of the sub doc wikis for all the past versions. You can look at what's new, what's different, uh, depending on which version you're coming from and going to. If you're going from exe 3 to exe 8 or to 10 Seattle, uh, there might be cool nuggets and tidbits about migrating things. So I think the biggest things, again, if you're in CBuilder 6 or 2007 and you haven't made the Unicode uh, crossing, C++ already had support for Unicode in a lot of the ways. It was really just the the, the VCL FireMonkey runtime library move to Unicode and support for Unicode across all the platforms that uh, that some people that were using things like strings and ANSI strings for uh, just pointers to memory because they were reference counted. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work in a Unicode world. So, but you can always redefine. Uh, those strings as, as ANSI strings, as Al showed, for example. So uh, send us emails, and we will uh, learn f from each other about my other migration issues that everyone's going to face and uh, document those and, and help you move forward to 10 Seattle and beyond. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Jim. And thank everyone for being with us.